everyone. Thank you for joining us for the closing session of the 2023 OWASP Global AppSec Singapore Conference. A special welcome also to those of you viewing this recording at a later time. My name is John DeLeo. I'm a leader of the OWASP New Zealand chapter and chair of the annual OWASP New Zealand Day Conference. And today it's my privilege to facilitate our closing session, introducing our keynote speaker. A couple of quick housekeeping notes. Our speaker's presentation will be up to 45 minutes, after which he'll have approximately 10 minutes for questions and answers. If you have a question for the speaker, please type it in the Q&A tab for this session in the Whova app or web application. At the end of the session, I'll review the submitted questions and present them to our speaker as time permits. Our closing keynote speaker today is Bernard Tan. Bernard is a director with, the, with Singapore's Government Technology Agency, GovTech, leading the agency's cybersecurity consultancy team. Today, he'll be speaking to us on the topic, defining and embracing the software fragility. Bernard? Hi, thanks. Thanks, John. Um, let me share my screen first, yeah. I hope everyone can see it. Okay. Yeah. John, you can see, right? Yes, sir, I can. Okay, sure. Let's let's start. Thanks, thanks everyone. Um I think it's been a long day, maybe a long night or even a long, you know, evening for, for most of you. Um I'm glad that you are um, you know staying on all the way. I I've been also in the conference, I've been hearing the topics and I'm quite intrigued by the way that um, the presenters have shared, and I'm not going to be too, you know, deep tech. I'm not going into quotes and all those stuff. Probably is to help you s summarize some of the takeaways for for this session. And I think particularly on this topic about software fragility. But before that, maybe let me also introduce myself again. Um, I'm Bernard. So I'm from GovTech, in short, for Government Technology Agency. Um, actually, you know, I I think most of the folks. Uh, in the industry, I think probably I'm the only odd one out. Um, we are looking at um government technology that is to bring digital good for the citizens. I think particularly uh for applications are uh, one thing that we are very in touch with. For myself, you know, I'm I've been in the public sector for quite a while. Um, I would have to say that it's a it's a long journey, but I have been throughout um dealing with cybersecurity, and and I think what really intrigued me is. We also do OWAPs. I think for those who have attended the conference um, probably last year, you probably also heard about me. And I was talking about you know, sustainability for application um, in an agile way. So, but I know when I come back again, um, I was thinking through you know, what sort of topics should I be sharing? And I start to read about you know, a lot about software being not, um, not resilient, you know, they are being vulnerable and they are being exploited. So I think that's why I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the fragility, which I think a lot of a lot of us probably have not really drawn or dive into the details. So maybe let, let's let's go on uh, and, and see what we can cover today. Um the agenda, um a few a few areas that we'll be looking at. Um of course, you know, probably we have to peel out the, the skin a little bit. What's this software about, right? Um What's the autonomy of it? And probably with that, probably we can understand what are the areas that potentially is weak in a certain area. Then of course, there will be certain contradiction that we'll be talking about, you know, we want to roll out the software fast, but at the same time, you know, we are also will be losing out our oversight in terms of some of the bugs and even some errors, which, you know, anyone that is found it may just well exploit it. Um, and does it matter? Yes, it must matter. So that's why I wanted to go a little bit into how can we actually make sure that some of those things that we're looking at in terms of securing our uh, software itself can really give us some returns. Um, not only just having a secure software, but you know, is there a better way that we can actually adopt modernized type of uh, software platforms or services that we can actually go about so that you know we can still get our service up, get our apps up, and we can still serve our customer well. And for me, I think 
my customer is the citizens and as well as the industry. So I, I hope to at least share that, you know, some of the thoughts and, you know, I welcome any feedback. And of course, um, lastly, some of the tips that I, I thought I wanted to share and yeah, and we can discuss through that. I think first thing first, um, let's take a, a step back. You know, when we talk about safety itself, you know, days goes well, you know, you are probably be driving um, and you're driving on the, on the same road. And do you know that actually, in fact, when we are doing all this, there's already some safety consideration uh, being done and implemented, right? You probably will be traveling in one way and because it's just one way and you don't expect any other cars or even any obstacle that's come along. But what if one day, you know, um, when you are out of unexpected and you found that there's some and there's a vehicle even coming on, on your way, what do you think will be next? It will be something that we won't want to see, right? Probably an incident. And it also seems goes to the case that when we are actually designing our apps and our software itself, is it always so straightforward and so, um, you know, just code it and then just deliver it? That's probably the case for many years ago. But the way now apps has been, you know, transformed, being developed, the number of libraries, the number of components, you know, and even with AI coming in, uh, it's getting more and more complicated. That's why even the case for the road, if you are in a situation that now you have the different options and you can't just simply just stay with designing a road that's always going straight and you can't expect the road just to be going straight. You'll be probably at the case where, you know what if there's a lot of vehicles coming in and it's not a straight road that you can accommodate all three of them. You probably have to consider having to have even like traffic lights, right? I'm getting into this analogy so that, you know, uh, we can understand a little bit, you know, some of this contradiction when we wanted to deliver fast, but at the same time, there's a huge, a lot of our conflicts that we may face. But to resolve the conflicts and at the same time, to make sure we still have a common outcome of safety, we need to do something. And in this case, you know, traffic light was one of the saviors in this case, where everyone take their time and you go through and I will get through when my time comes. Then how about cases where it's not only just traffic light and just straight roads, right? We also can have the case where there's more cars. And how do we actually now settle this to make sure that we can still get everyone to their destination in a safe manner? And it can be a case that we can put in conditions, right? Put in conditions where everyone in this case is a roundabout, where vehicles itself can actually move on and they will take their turns and they will move around. And when the exit comes, they will just edit. So the condition itself can also bring us to a safety outcome. Then how about, you know, in a case that there's a lot of different vehicles going on different ways, if you can't set up a traffic light, you can't even have a certain condition, you can't even build a roundabout, how do you do it? And in this case, it can even be a, a highway. It can be something that, you know, um, you ask the vehicle to travel on the top while you're maybe traveling down the tunnel. So these are different ways, right, um, that we are looking at. If you want to drive a certain, in this traffic analogy, traffic light analogy that we are talking about, um, to drive safety, there's different conditions and different methods to still reach the outcome, safety. So how about we now bring this back to building a software? Can we apply the same analogy? And if I were to also take a look at the software itself, um, by by its word, right? Soft means, you know, uh, in a way, sort of fragile. But do we really understand the term uh, called fr fragile? Um, to me, I think it's simple. Something that can be broken, you know, and it's not easily being patched back. And I think the diagram speaks all, right? If there's a little bit of heat and there's a little bit of uh, more heat, you'll be badly broken. And it's not easy to recover. And and I would say that this anti-fragility um, term is not really new. Um, I came upon this book um, by Nassim Taleb on anti-fragile. I think it was interesting in the sense that it actually intrigued me and, and got into this topic. Talking about things can actually, actually excel by leveraging the disorder. 
That means there's more randomness introduced. It can still grow. It can still make sure that it's not within the baseline that is supposed to be secure. And I thought that's very interesting. And we have to also understand that, you know, anti-fragility itself doesn't mean that uh, it means that you'll be getting more harder or you're getting more softer. It, and it also doesn't mean that you become more robust. It's actually just talking about your software. If it's anti-fragile, in this case, it's able to still sustain and able to sustain long enough such that even if there's an attack surface, you are probably still alright. And there's a certain risk that you have already measured. And that's why in the same analogy for human itself, right? Um, sometimes if we were to exercise and stress our muscle a little bit more, in fact, it comes stronger. You may feel, you may feel the ache, but after a while, you know, you've been exercising, um, you probably will feel stronger because your muscle have grown. And likewise, it's the same thing. Can we actually um, sort of make our software tough enough? Um, I think in my last sharing in uh, one year ago, I was talking about software secure enough. And I think down here, I'm talking about now having to go to the extent of having toughened it up. And if your software can actually withstand stress itself, it does mean that you know, um, there's a certain amount of consideration being designed into the software. And likewise, you know, there are certain things that we have to consider. If your software is a bit too overly too complex, you probably are creating a lot of, you know, gaps that you probably are un unknown of. And, and if something happens, you know, you'll be caught off guard. And there's also a case where you need to make sure that there's a certain baseline. And that's why there's a lot of strengthening that is needed. And if you can do this too well, actually you'll be feeling much more happier. I think that's an analogy that I, I wanted to uh, start off with to just to share a bit on what anti-fragility means to me, at least, and also to relate that back into software. Um, but having to drill a little bit further, I think we have to put some context back to it because fragility itself can't be just about talking about stress, right? And I think during the conference, I, I, I saw the topic that was shared, um, a lot of discussion about attack surface. Um, and there's also something that was not really much mentioned is about protect surface. Attack surface are some things that we are talking about exposure area. You know your website being exp um, being vulnerable. It's not patched. You know it's exposed to the internet, and people start to exploit it. And those are a surface where attackers will will love it. And there's also areas where you need it as a defender that you need to protect, and we call that protect surface, just to make sure that you know um they are good enough in terms of security, and they are also being toughened up such that they can withstand certain stress. But we also have to peer a little bit, dice a little bit further now um, into what software means, right? Software itself can be a can be quite a big uh, component. And we can talk about, you know, the very fundamentals about having a web server, you know, web services run at the backend by, you know, your web logic, your application servers, and also not forgetting about, you know, the storages of your data which is your database. And with these three tiers that we're talking about, and can you apply the attack and the protect surface that we're talking about? Will it be a case that, you know, you are looking at the attack surface as just purely anything that's facing the internet, like your web server, and you are wanting to protect everything, your application, your logic, as well as your databases. That would be one of the options. Then how about this? Some of the folks may also be thinking, no, I, 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 I would think, you know, um, the attackers will also be exploiting not only the web servers, but also my application logic. So I'm, I'm pretty quite um, worried about it. So my attack surface actually increases. And probably what I will really want to really protect is my data. And that's why it brought into a database that's of this option. And how about, you know, the case that some that's very, very risk adverse, and I think also including myself, you know, I would think almost everywhere can be attacked. And those are areas that could bring us exposure. But at the same time, you know, there's some overlaps in terms of how we want to protect things. And that is to me a sense of how we will look at um, in terms of attack and protect surface. And I, can, I would say that it really differs for everyone. And it's just a very simple systems that we're talking about, the three tiers, and you can have many different combinations. 
But to really understand and really to measure and to be able to say that, you know, how fragile our software is, we probably have to take these two parameters to help us to measure it. And that's why I, I sort of wanted to share a bit on these two, two pointers. But we also have to be a, be a bit more savvy, right? Uh, now hackers are not breaking in. They're actually logging in. They get their credential and, and that's it. They probably will be coming in. They will probably be assessing almost everywhere. And your attack surface will be pretty huge. Even if you think that, you know, your web server is good enough. And that's why we probably have to look at even the weakest link um, and how do we actually be able to design a software such that, you know, we have a good balance between the attack and the protect surface. And that's why it brought me to the case that um, it's also not a very um, easy um, problem, I would say, because there's so many much more com um, combination. And if I were to draw these two lines, you know, the Y and X axis that we are talking about, having the attack surface as the horizontal and the protect surface as the vertical. And if we were to start to design a system, and we take the analogy of the same three tails that we're talking about, maybe you have one system that is really, really just a pure web service with some web logics behind, but you are you are filling a lot of uh, disparate databases that you have to you know, reach out to search for by your application logic. So I, I tend to see this as a more fragmented uh, design. But in a, in a way, would there be areas that you have to protect more? Yes, because of your databases. Then at the same time, we also have, uh, you know, the more complacent type, right? Keeping the design very simple. But at the same time, when stress comes, we are not so sure whether they can actually handle that. Yeah, the attack and the protect surface probably are not as much, but probably are we able to still call themselves uh, to be less fragile than it is? Is something that we can take a look. And when we start to design things, when your application starts to scale, right, your demands of the users, the rate of access, you probably will be scaling up, you know, and, and, and the way that now we are building in the cloud, you know, auto-scaling and all those sorts, these are things that can be getting more and more complicated. And, and in this case, as it gets more complicated, it also means that um, the attack surface itself also increases. And are we ready for that? And I think lastly, the, the the quadrant that we are looking at is, you know, there also be cases that we probably wanted to um, handle the internet traffic pretty well, right? You know, um, you want to get more visits, you want to get more attention um, from the folks that's outside, you know, visiting your sites itself. But you probably may have missed out, you know, um, the scaling part where your application probably will be very stressed. And you still are serving a lot of different products, different data and insights that you needed to. So such design itself is really quite top and bottom heavy. And are we still able to make sure that we are quite robust and not fragile? So these are the four different four terms that I'm talking about in terms of fragmentation, complacency and complexity as well as favorable that we are looking at. So these are challenge. And I'm not saying that these are the only um, designs that we are looking at, but four of it does represent most of the software that I have at, at least been experienced and have seen some of the proposals so far. But at the same time, we also have to ask ourselves if we will do it. And I'm, I'm talking about the topic about software um, fragility, right? So it does mean that if you have built the software, is it secure and it's just enough? And can it withstand certain search in terms of performance? And can you stress it enough such that a long time, it can still maintain the amount of gains that it's supposed to give it to you, the performance that you still require. But we know that sometimes, you know, um, there's always a breaking point where till that breaking point itself, that's where probably your design have, you know, because of resources, because of, uh, you know, budget or whatever stuff, that may be something that we cannot handle. Or it may be in it, inherently the design itself doesn't allow you to cater to such a search in terms of demand as well as the performance needs that you need. Um, maybe the platform, maybe the environment, maybe you're still on-prem, you haven't gone to the cloud. So these are things that we, we have to recognize that there will be breakage for all the different types of systems. Even as you start to build your gains, you probably may not be sustaining it long enough if a certain uh, level of stress have been exited into it. 
And I have to say that, you know, uh, are, am I just talking about fictions? No, not really the case. If you look at some of the um, cyber incident, I, I believe some of the tracks itself have also discussed quite intensively on some of the, you know, the vulnerabilities, the codes, how the API has been exploited, how the key has been stolen. And am I just listing some of it? Like for the case about the, um, the incidents that we are talking about, right? There's also pivoting of you know, third parties having to be the weakest link and because, you know, they have poor practices and they have been pivoted in. And there's also cases, you know, solar winds and the cohort. These are, I believe the, the community will probably know it better um, that these are areas where a vulnerability was actually found and actually it's through the pipeline. It's not detected at all. And that itself can indirectly, you know, introduce more risk because there may be certain attacks that's coming in and while we are really unknown. And more to the extent that you probably don't even know the components that we're looking at. And there's a lot, a lot of variation, log4j, you know, um, the GitHub in terms of apps that's coming in, keys that you feel that you are actually using to secure and probably, you know, uh, have you been protecting it pretty well. So there's a lot of different dependencies, right? Even I would say even a like misconfigurations and even vulnerability that's not patched, which is very common. And for cases where, you know, really your hygiene is not at your best, and also areas where you are, you have not configured it well, you have not tested it enough, and it's exposed to the internet. And if I were to put it against just now the typical archetype that we are talking about, you know, I can sort of you know, map it into these four areas again, due to really dependencies that we have, because it's overly complex in terms of design. Um, you are using certain vulnerable components, but probably you are not aware of. Um, and at the same time, you know. There's so much of the assets that you are trying to handle and you probably maybe, you know, due to certain errors, misconfigure certain things. And also for those that is pretty com complacent, right? Although it's simple design, you probably are not keeping up to the cyber hygiene because as things goes, as the application's version changes, right? Have you been keeping up to the patches to the best of diligence? So I think for all these things, if I were to sum up, it's really a case of there's a lot of design different hidden uh, residual gaps that we are looking at. And the fragility, I would say, along the time you have seen the graph that I have shared, um, can actually grow also quite exponential and you can actually drop your, your value pretty even fast over time, right? And these are really making it worse, right? Is if really a real incident comes, right? I think you will see more greater damages, not only just purely resetting your credentials, losing your credentials, um, the customer data will actually be impacted, which is one of our most worrying um, cases if anything were to happen. So would there be a would there be a case where you know um just let it be in this manner or sh or can we do something more? I think we can toughen up uh, no matter what you know when things are soft right we, we can always exercise um, when you feel weak, you know why don't you take on some exercises? keep your body healthy and, and sort of, I think same applies also for software. Um, if you start off where you started to design and you know that there's certain weak area in terms of software, maybe because of certain, certain legacy components that you are still using, you know, during your tech refreshes, you probably have to make sure that these are being replaced. So what are some of the mitigation and compensating controls that you can design within your software? And it's sufficient enough to tide you through such that when really a hit or a stress come or you know a attack comes, you can still be broken, but probably not as broken as before. So there are certain resiliencies that we're talking about here. Um, but of course, you know, in certain cases, uh, you just don't want to get yourself into be really, really badly broken. Like the initial case where you know um the starting foundation is really very weak. Um, but I think for for even fragility, we are talking about the durability across different uh, four factors. And that's why I wanted to introduce a bit on, you know, what are we looking at? It's not just purely resilient. I think first thing first, we are talking about some robustness. That means it, even having stress enough, I you are still be able to withstand it. Then there are also cases where, you know, um, you can design the software such that it's recoverable. I'm not saying you are self-healing, but at a certain point, you feel that, you know, you can restore your backup. You feel that you can spin up another workload just to handle certain damages so that the traffic itself won't be overwhelming the systems. 
then at the same time, you may also be uh, rejuvenating it, right? Maybe of the case that, you know, the three tier is not enough, you probably have to relook at, I, I probably have to adopt more modernized platforms, serverless or sort of. Now, I think lastly, of course, is the resiliency where we still need to be able to adapt, right? Are we able to switch and adapt and be flexible enough to handle all the different types of condition um, and continue to make sure that the service is still uh, keeping the lights up? And that's why if I were to go back to the same, you know, the four quadrants that we're talking about, uh, and now if it's the case that we want to keep fit, right? Making sure that our software is uh, not fragile, but can be toughened up just enough for, for it to serve and continue to serve the value. Um, so I think for the first case, when we're talking about the, the fragmented part where I'm saying that, you know, the different databases that you have, you know, that is all disparate and you have a very thin uh, web server and app server itself, probably you can consider that you can design the system such that it's very event driven, right? Based on certain events and you can actually manipulate or even uh, broker the, the traffic such that only when the submission comes, then you start to activate and start to assess a particular database. So you don't always have to, you know, just forward the whole request back to the databases, event base. Then at the same time, when we talk about uh, complacency, I'm, I'm really talking about really the foundation of having it to be resilient at the same time. So there may be the case that because of the fact that it's a simple design, but you also see that there's a point of failure. And in this case, I'm suggesting, you know, why not you can manage the, the traffic flow. It's like, you know, a uh, certain causeway or certain causeway going to different states itself, right? You have somewhere where it comes in and goes out in a channel that you can fully control it. And for that case itself, you may be looking at um, having to manage the traffic such that things don't um, go to the certain extent, uh, aggressive state where, you know, you'll be just be flooded. And also for the case where we're talking about, you know, the system is just too complex in terms of design. Um, and I think in this case now, it's probably because of there's a lot of different varieties of requests you are handling. And maybe you have, you have to start to think about, should I start to develop an API stack? An API where you can serve a very particular uh, micro functions that is required. And you can start to think about, you know, API gateway, your broker, so that it's robust enough to handle different services, certain functions. But yeah, I have to say that it does require you to refactor a bit on how your data is being assessed, how your application is able to serve a particular, you know, um, audience and users in the use case. Um, at the same time, I would say for the recovery part, we are also talking about the case that, is there any way that, you know, if I, if I'm still handling certain requests, can I able to hot or even slow down and delay the new request that's coming in? I think message queue is a is probably something that probably some of you already know it very well. And it's part of the design. I would say if you have already considered it, that's good. Because in a way you are actually decoupling the the very tightly um uh, coupled uh, design where you know where your top and bottom, your app, your web and your databases are very huge and you are very lean. And in that case, you probably need something to decouple both of them. And that's why I feel that messaging queue is something that you can consider. And these four components are, are not new. I think for the, for the community here that has been designing apps, securing apps, these are components that I, I would think besides just patching and besides just having secure coding, I think we also have to look into the design and architecture part where you got the right components into so that you can actually toughen up the overall software um, security. And if we were to go back to the same graph again, and in this case that we are talking about, if we were to put in the right components that's probably inside, you probably will be looking at the case that you can sustain a little bit more. You don't immediately have a drastic drop in terms of the value, but you can stretch a little bit further. And, you know, because of the different ways you design and your foundation and architecture have been different, um, you probably can sustain longer, uh, which I, I will say in this case, you increase the survivability at the same time, reduce the impact to your businesses. But of course, we know that, you know, for too prolong of a stress itself, you know, even human itself will just break. So eventually you will see the curve and the arrows will still go down. Yeah, but till that stage, you probably have been thinking how, how to make sure that you 
you probably set up the systems already to make sure that things goes on. Or if not, you probably have to rethink of other options. So I so if we were to sort of move on to the the, the next bit of it, um by just redesigning and re-architecting the whole software stack itself, or even the architecture, is it sufficient enough? Is there more that we can do, right? Or is it that we just purely want it to drop further now? I think that's a way, um, but probably, you know, exercise is still the foundation, the hygiene that is still required. So that's why if I were to, we have to really think through about the roadmap. It's not just purely, you know, feature releases. I think we should also look through in the extent that in certain states that you were to have the same heat and the same stress itself, are we able to make sure that we don't get ourselves so broken up? This is the initial state that we have been talking about so far. But if we can go into the extent that, you know, um, you know, if we also watch our diet, you know, not just purely uh, exercising it, we get the right components, we, we know and know the behavior of how our apps is and we can design it in a way that we can make sure that we can always be fit itself. I think any amount of stress that comes in, you probably will be able to handle it pretty well. And that's why I think a route mapping does make sense. And if I were to take back the case about, you know, uh, the four different broad uh, incidents that we've been looking at, like for the first case, talking about the third party, we're talking about gaps that is really the dependency part, which we know that in part of our software design itself, if you can recognize the, de the dependency that you are using, be it a library, open source uh, components that you are using it, you probably will be more savvy and more ready to say that, you know, the next log 4 j that comes in again, you probably know which are my application servers that's using it. So I think s um indirectly will be one of the things that we will, should be uh, looking at in the longer future, if not, even start now, right? Knowing our set is, is very much important. It's not just purely the hardware, but even the configuration. I think second is also looking at the components. Is there certain components that you feel that, you know, um, if the attacker were to get it and you will be breaking down the whole software, like your keys, right? Like your account keys, like your secrets, like your encryption keys, are you storing them in the in an area where you are confident enough that you are the only one that can assess it, or you are saying that you know anyone can just assess it, so you know that's why I think wearing the developer's hat, um, we have to consider even rotation, and I think um there's also interesting ideas where we're talking about there shouldn't be a need for even any permanent keys. We are talking about secretless now, right? Do we really need a secret, or do we need a secret for just one hour, right? So all these temporal type of keys. Maybe something in an area where your software should actually be considering. Then I think thirdly is also on the misconfiguration. We are talking about um, I wouldn't think misconfiguration just come with it. You know the day two things where things have been done, you probably have hardened it before. But what have made the changes such that you you went into a state where it, it shouldn't be configured, right? A lot of this change management is something that we the day two we if we have not paid attention enough. Um, it can be easily be exposing yourself to the internet, um, you know, street kiddies and even the attackers. So I, I would say for application that is really external phasing, you need to be very clear, you know, what are the external networks that we are looking at and what more better to do than you test yourself. You have a way to continue the test. I, I know there's also technologies like attack surface uh, management, uh, which may be useful because in a way it's trying to cover certain blind spots that you are not aware of when you're launching the, the services. And it may also be, be launching by different product teams that you are probably not in contact with and not aware of. I think lastly is that really hygiene part. Um, no matter what we do in terms of design and architecture, we should always be making sure that, you know, patching, uh, keeping up to date in terms of all the implementation, um, findings that's in your vulnerability scanning, you are on top of things, you are making sure that all these gaps are being addressed as fast as possible um, and doing the necessary risk management and risk acceptance. And that's why I would say your infrastructure is something that you will be the, the best where you can actually implement all the change management and make sure that changes you can centrally manage, right? And of course, um, changes should be made by authorized uh, folks and it shouldn't be just anyone, right? 
Otherwise, you, you probably will be having any of the findings, any of the changes that you all be leading you to more fertility that you will not be expecting of. So I think on the longer term, if I would sum up everything itself, we are really looking at the, the part about having to look at your application portfolio, uh, looking at in terms of the assets that I've talked about, and in terms of architecture, can you make it more repeatable? IEC is something that we're looking at. Um, and of course, at the same time, is there certain offloading that can be done? Just in the sense that you don't overload a particular app and the services. If you can make it simple, make it more micro, you should consider that. Then at the same time, not only the application portfolio by itself, you should also be looking at how this application is being developed. Um, are you making use of pipelines or are you still doing the manual way of version checking and, and releasing it? Right. And at the same time, is your developer also looking at coding uh, good practices in terms of um, having to make sure the codes are by default secure? Or are you also leveraging on you know, peer reviews or even co-pilot you know, with the re recent launch of you know, um, like GitHub co-pilot and the rest of things that we're looking at? But I think one fundamental thing is also good documentation. It's something that we, we shouldn't neglect. If your API is not documented well, who will know how to interact with it, right? And who will even know that this API even exists? I think documentation is, is um, fundamental things that we should be looking at and something that we should be watching out for. And I think lastly, um, I talk about the infrastructure part. Uh, not only the portfolio and the development environment, we should also consider the resiliency in terms of the platform. And if we were to come up with any solution, think of platform first before trying to roll out into a particular uh, solutions. If you are looking at API, should you consider API gateway? If you are doing a code pipeline, should you consider a centralized pipeline? And if you are doing a certain IDE itself, is there certain uh, developer endpoints that you're looking at? Will you be going through some virtual machines just to make sure that everyone have a standard set of our security policies? So these are things that we're looking at and at the same time, be able to measure Right, I, I would think all the guardrails are good if you can measure it. And there's no point having to add more controls when you can't even measure it. You don't even know whether is it effective enough or are you adding overly too, too much load into the platforms itself. Right? And I think more and more, we should be able to test it out. So don't be afraid about you know things will break. Things will definitely break. It's a matter of whether how gracefully can you break it and make sure that it's actually progressively degrading and you have the time enough to detect it and then respond into it, right? So I would say chaos engineering is something that even my, my team and my, my folks are really looking at it. So going beyond uh, durability for our software, anything else? Is there anything more that we can be looking at? I talked about this uh, in the earlier stage where, you know, the way that we design our systems have a breaking point. Then at the same time, we're also talking about, you know, probably we can do a little bit on our design and our architecture change just to slow down the stress uh, so that, you know, it doesn't drop drastically. But if you were more adventurous, do you think you can actually go beyond what this diagram is showing? Can it even, to a certain extent, be able to go beyond the benefits rather than just dropping out? I would think is possible. Do I have any solutions? I don't have any solutions, but I welcome the committee to share it, which I think that's why I, if I were to go about looking at things, I, I think we, we shouldn't be complacent with status quo. We should always be adventurous to look at innovative um, and encourage innovation. When the developers wanted to try out something, you know, encourage them, um, but just to make sure that there's always a safety boundary and what we are looking at. But at the same time, go from your very complex design, you should always go for simplicity. And for components that is really not needed, you should just remove it. Um, a lot of times we are talking about subtraction. And I think if you can subtract more, actually you probably will gain more. And your design is simpler and probably you can be more anti-fragile in this case. Um, so my last two slides, I'm, I just want to sum up uh, in terms of the takeaway. So I, I talk a lot about all the different things that um, we are looking at, but probably uh, five points that we can take away. So first, I think um, no one will secure the software just because you tell them so. Uh, so we need to in, in incentivize them, give them some encouragement, right? And I think this shift left is not just 
we can just verbally say it. I think we have to walk through, we have to understand the challenges that they have. Um, and we shouldn't be just alone. I think there should be peer and we should help watch out for one another. Who knows, right? If the co-pilot does help, you know, why not try it out? And I think also at the same time, uh, we know the releases of the software uh, at a very fast speed, right? Your your check-in, your merge request, all these will become come in, in very furiously. So think about really through a platform, a platform where you can have a central policy, where you can encourage uh, at the same time agility, but at the same time, there's certain checkpoints that is put in place. And I think one thing that um like I, I sort of mentioned quite a, quite a few times is on the documentation. Um, a lot of decision has been made, uh, a lot through your stand-ups and, and sort of, but I would think that if you are looking at that, uh, you should be really seriously be looking at um, having to record down all the decision. In this case, I'm looking at the minimal viable architecture. Yeah. And I think also the, the last point I'm looking at is uh, in terms of designing, you should look at some of the modern uh, designs that we're looking and in this case, rather than, you know, your web app servers, there's containers, there's serverless, there's even service mesh. Are these things that you should actually be looking out for? Then in terms of um, subscribing to um, message queue events itself, would that be something that you can consider in your design? And I would say analytics is something that you should also make sure that your design are not stagnant. You always have a loop in terms of feedback so that you can collect all these metrics and plan in the future how you can better address certain search that you can predict. So my last slide, uh, my full of the time also. Um, nonetheless, I think it's a community thing. Um, if we can set the same KPIs, if we can document some credible practices, drive and share your success story, I, I would think this, um, and you can start with the mindset, I think you will be not alone. And at the same time, uh, also try to also empathize other people's failure, right? When people share stories, um, if you hear more failure story, I think you will benefit more. But people are so very fearful in terms of sharing all these aspects. Um, but I think, you know, OWAPS and AppSec is just one of the few community conferences that we share some of our learnings. And I also appreciate, appreciate some of the uh, folks that was presenting just now, sharing of their retrospective experience in terms of the, the failure cases or the, the um, engagement that they have. So continue this, I think it's very useful, even at the team level or organization level. And also there's always room for us to improve. And it doesn't mean that you know any team itself um, is the most knowledgeable. We should learn from one another and share our uh, perspective in terms of how we can actually gain more. Yeah, if not, that's my end. Um, thanks everyone for hearing, yeah. Thank you so much, Bernard. Hi. Yeah. All right. At this time, I'd like to invoke folks listening in live to enter your questions in the Q&A tab in Whova. And while we're waiting to see what our audience would like to know, I have a couple of comments and questions for you. Yeah. <clears throat> First, I, I thought it was really interesting, the, the whole analogy that uh, you put together of, of the software's, well, mm. first off, it's softness, <laughs> and then um, likening the wellness of a software application to personal wellness and yep. the same sorts of um, building of resilience and health and strength that we need to do personally. So it's, it's a really interesting analogy. And I, I can see that that could potentially resonate with folks, especially in the business. Mm. The, um, the first question that I had for you was, is it reasonable to expect that every application can mm. achieve an anti-fragility state? Mm. Actually, it's a good question, John. Um, that is also a question I ask myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I were to say yes, um, I, I would be bluffing myself. If I would say no, I would also be doubting myself. I, I, would, I would think it's a, it's a journey. Everyone eventually will, will reach that state. But I would think that first is to probably understand what's our definition of fragility. Your fragility and my fragility probably are different. My fragility is probably if I can meet my SLA, you know, 99.5, you know, that's probably good enough. And some of the some of the other folks may be looking at a different benchmark they are looking at. So my, my suggestion is uh, for any of the software that is 
really wanting to study a little bit into you know how fragile my my software is set some benchmark um understand where is the area that you feel that is more vulnerable that means define your attack surface and then also at the same time you know which are, is an area that you feel that you are most concerned of define the boundary as an area that you want to protect a bit more then you have the measurement and eventually you know um, when you sort of able to draw out your attack boundaries and and draw out your protect surfaces, right? You can actually invest on how much you want to uh, make sure you are securing them enough. Then that itself will probably be the case that you are already moving towards one step um, towards making sure that it's more robust and more anti-fragile. Yep. So in that answer, I heard you say eventually a few times. Mm. So how fast could we expect a software to get to this anti-fragile state? Mm. Um, I, I would say it takes time um, because you, if we were to look at some of the things that I've been sharing so far, uh, it talks a lot about design and architecting. So it's not about like, you know, um, uh, codeless or whatever, putting in some libraries, compiling it and then just go and, and, and you can reach that anti-fragile state. I, I would think we have to take a look into uh, first, what's your business need? And next is how can you design a systems? Like just now I mentioned the four components, message queue, um, API gateway, uh, event driven, and even to the certain extent, making sure that when things break, you can actually fail over. If you can start to even start to design every components that you put into your systems that already are able to make sure that they don't break it easily. I think you will be going to a very good state that it is more anti-fragile. But the question is how long? And if you were to do it in every component and it's not automated and it's purely, you know, I, I depend on my designer and my, my security architect to tell me what to do, then I think it's probably not possible. But if you can start with a base of a component and be able to make it as a blueprint and start to encourage people to use it, and then build that platform where people just need to focus on probably certain areas that is their business logic. And the rest of it, you just build it into the foundation and lay it as a platform and people start to use it. I think it will go faster. So if we do it silo, building components, putting in the fragility, you know, um, uh, mitigation alone, I think is going to be very slow. But if you were to do it at the platform level, which I, I suggested the team to look at it, um, then you will be as fast as what your product team is trying to uh, save up, right? You don't want them to actually create a lot of different APIs, but you probably want to make sure you have an API marketplace enough to actually serve them so that they don't, need, don't even have to consider about the platform and they just have to um, handle what the business logic is and do their necessary testing. Yeah. Yeah. I had another question. I think you partially answered it just then, but... If I, if I look at my portfolio and I have a mixture of fragmented, complacent, com complex, and friable systems, what should I focus my initial first priorities on? Which, which mm -hmm. ones maybe give us um, either would reduce my risk the most or maybe they're mm -hmm. the easiest to get fixed? Yeah. Actually, it's exactly in the, in the same slides that I have. <laughs> I, I think we need to understand first what do you want to protect. Um, there's too many areas, right? Like, like say, even <laughs> a, a hacker is actually now hack is logging in. They are not even they are not even you know uh you know trying to hack you, right? Um, so so that's why I say go back to fundamental. What are the things that you want to protect? Is it your data? If it's your data, then start from there, right? You may be indifferent, you know, you, you may be uh, fragile, you may be complex, you may be fragmented. But I think that if you are very clear, if you are very clear on what you need to protect. For me, I think that data is important and which leads into my encryption key is very important. And because my key can be accessible by someone, my account is very important. And because my account is important, my identity management needs to be tip-top condition. And if I were to say uh, the way that we are moving on, and I'm also into the, the journey of zero trust, 
um, more and more often identity become really the passport to almost all of these um, data that we're talking about, which can be in, in the cloud, in the SaaS, M365 or whatever. So if you can protect your identity and you can protect your keys and your secrets very well, I would think that you can go very far and I would think that you already set the foundation no matter how fragile or how complex the design is because the attacker will have a hard time logging in now because they have no keys, no, no secrets, no credential. So they probably have to wait for another zero day, another vulnerability before they can actually, you know, get in and hack it in. So um, I would I would think priority wise, um, look at the the keys and the secrets that you have, um, and I think that two areas that I'm looking at uh, in the near future is uh, we shouldn't have to store any keys, even if we do store, you know, just store for one hour. Then at the same time is you shouldn't have privileged users. Um, and that's why you don't have privileged accounts. Um, everyone should actually request on an on-demand basis. You need to do something, I give you that one hour, you finish it, I revoke your account. <laughs> so it's a bit of secretless and adminless in, in a certain sense, which I think if we can design the systems and software in that manner, um, I think we are very much ahead a, a lot on other of the software that is coming up. Yep. And from our listener, Carmen, question. Do yep. you have any suggestions for tools that can analyze a given architecture for fragility? Mm. In, in fact, I will, I will say that internally, we even wanted to do uh, uh, such tool itself. But I have to say straight front, um, if you were to try to search, um, you probably will, will find a lot about, you know, attack surface management, which is trying to touch on your attack surface. You probably will look at you know your 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 sims your your CASB, a lot of security controls, but none of it actually really look at the blueprint out of it. The closest I can find is if you are able to lock in with a certain uh blueprint and template. For example, IAC infrastructure as a code, you probably will be making it such that that's your blueprint. And I would think that the community will know better that there's already IAC scanners and sort of. My suggestion is add in another layer called the policy as a code or security as a code. Have another layer of blueprint and stack, stack set itself that is able to add in the necessary controls that is need. And I, I would think for those that is familiar with AWS, there's a lot of uh, cloud formation and there's a lot of stack, stack set that you can look at. Don't only stop on one, also create one that's on security. And then eventually, because these are all codified, you are able to actually scan it. And that is your tool itself. But if you ask me, is there a commercial tool that does this? Probably not at this moment. Probably not. But who knows, right? Um, maybe the AI model folks uh, will, will be looking into it. <laughs> but if anyone have any tools, you know, please suggest. I'm, I'm more than welcome and wanted to know more. Thank you. And yep. last, yep, we have a minute or so for one more question. Yep. So even if you get your software to an anti-fragile state, what are what are the potential residual risks? Mm, good question. Um, my, my own thought is uh, eventually things will break. Uh, so as any of the cyber folks will always say, right, always assume breach. I, I would say anti-fragility, um, anti this term is just to say that it, it doesn't mean that it's robust. It's just say that it's durable. It's durable for a period of time when eventually, no matter how much I exercise, how good my diet is, my age will catch up, my body will malfunction. But by that time, the only thing that probably will do is you should have buy insurance. You want to make sure you, know, you spend good enough time, you enjoy your life, and, and that's about it. And don't add in more stress. So going back to software analogy itself, I would say that you should be prepared that things will break. Um, cyber term, we call it the assumed breach, right? So are you able to recover or do you have backup itself, right? Do you know that when your data center is not around or when AWS cut you off, what's your next step? Do you have a fallback plan? Do you have a certain contingency? So I'd rather that we don't overly protect because things will eventually break 
be also investing sufficiently enough for contingency planning. And, and the best way to do it is like I say, like just now I mentioned, do chaos engineering, right? Go and set the chaos, go and stress it all the way. There's a breaking point. And when it breaks, and you can actually start to surface how you will respond if your contingency plan is really effective. And that's how we actually will test it out. But I would say if you want to stretch all the way, then I would say you probably have to make sure that uh, you prepare the media response uh, when things are not right and if it's internet facing. And if anything were to ask, you know, just make sure that you are ready to, to, to get onto it. Yep. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Bernard, and for your presentation. Thanks. And to our audience, this concludes our closing keynote session, and with it, this year's conference. On behalf of OWASP and the conference planning team, I'd like to thank everyone who joined us during today's virtual event and extend a special thank you to our sponsors, Curious Risk, F5, and B-Side Singapore. We look forward to having everyone join us again. Have a great day.